Hey everybody, it's Dr. Galvin with a coronavirus update. Sorry, it's been a few days since we posted last, been very, very busy. Lots going on uh, in terms of the virus. So this is actually gonna be a two-part video. We're gonna do part of it today, and then the second half I'll post tomorrow. Um, in case of you guys are new, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Galvin. I'm an emergency physician and a functional medicine physician in Charlotte, North Carolina. Been working in the emergency department since this started and have been posting updates uh, as we've gone along. We'll um, you can go back and look at our Facebook page and our YouTube channel for updates going all the way back to the very beginning of this. We usually start this with, with numbers and you know the numbers have been fairly high lately. 13 million cases worldwide. I'm gonna put my little paper up here. Uh, 571,000 deaths in the U.S., 3.36 million cases. Having a little technical difficulties here. And um, 137,000 deaths. In North Carolina, we've had about 87,500 cases, about 1,500 deaths. You know, I'm very familiar with the numbers in North Carolina. So, uh, you know, one of the numbers we've been looking at is hospitalization numbers. When we reopened on about the 22nd of May, we had about 500, 550 patients admitted to the hospital. Um, as of today, it's 1,040, so it nearly doubled. I think those numbers are important to watch because also, you know, what we've done, how we admit people is different than when we first started. When, when people came in to the emergency department at the very beginning of this, we were really scared, we didn't really know much. So our threshold for admitting people to the hospital, especially if they were in a risky group, was pretty low. Now that we've become better at treating it, we're better at, at monitoring how people are doing, the threshold to get admitted to the hospital for COVID is, is actually pretty high. You've gotta be fairly sick to get admitted. So that 1,040 number, in my, the way I look at it, those are probably you know, 1,000 pretty sick people. Now, we've been hearing that you know, death rates are lower, they're starting to creep up. Well, I think you need to understand sort of the natural course of this disease. Um, for those folks who are going to do badly with it, you know, they're going to get sick and then they're going to be, you know, probably home for a week or so and then they might get a little bit better and then they kind of take a turn for the worse and then they end up in the hospital. Um, over the next week or so, a percentage of those people are going to get sicker still and, and some of those people are going to end up in the ICU and then some of them are going to be intubated on a ventilator. And then if they're going to die, they're not going to die for, for several weeks. So, you know, typically, people are passing away because they've been on the ventilator for extended periods of time, are, are passing away you know, a month or so afterwards. So death rates are going to lag hospitalization rates. Now luckily, you know, a lot of the surges we've seen have been be because of protests and young people not socially distancing. So a lot of those cases are younger patients. So that's very good news because we know the younger you are, the lower risk you are. But the problem is that those younger people then subsequently expose their parents and their grandparents. And so we get this sort of multiple, you know, generations of the disease. So the fact that we're seeing low death rates is a very good thing, I agree. But, you know, I, as a physician, I look at those numbers and I kind of know the natural progression. And it probably means we're gonna see higher death rates, you know, come three, four weeks from now. But I'm also hoping that we're gonna see lower infection rates because people are starting to take this pretty seriously and they're really starting to, to double down on social distancing and masks and things like that. So presumably we'll see infection rates start dropping. Um, and that's what we're hoping for. And we should start seeing that hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, a couple of interesting studies that came out. One was about um, immunity. And there was a, a study out of the UK that showed that only, a, you know, that, that immunity may not be lasting for this um, virus. And, um, it was now granted it was a small study. It's not been peer reviewed yet, but they did I think 65 patients, and at three months, only 17% of those patients that had COVID retained any appreciable immunity. Even though about 60% of those patients developed a pretty potent immune response, meaning they responded well to the virus. Now, one concern is, you know, that reading the studies, there's this concern that if people have these asymptomatic cases or minimally symptomatic cases, then they're really not developing good, good amounts of antibodies and they may not be immune going long term. Now, there's a lot more studies to be done about this. We don't really know yet, but you know, that study is a little concerning that we, we may not develop great immunity, which means it may be a, you know, a seasonal disease like the flu. Now, people have asked me, you know, how are positive cases 
you know, counted if you get tested multiple times. And um, I do have the answer for North Carolina. I, I'm assuming that it's, it's similar nationwide, but each positive test, test is counted one time. So if you go in and you get tested and you're positive, it counts as one. If your employer sends you back in to get retested and you're still positive, it doesn't count as a second positive. So you, if you get tested four times and you have four positives, it counts as one positive, not four positives. So a couple of people have asked me that question. Um, that's clearly defined by the state of North Carolina. And I think many other states follow the same thing because it would be silly to, to count every time somebody tested positive as a positive. Um, you know, these case spikes we, we've been following, um, you know, certainly in other states, it's become, you know, very severe. Florida, Arizona, Texas, um, here locally in North Carolina, our test positivity rate is about 10%, which is much higher than we want. We really want to see that number below 5%. But, you know, I think in Arizona and places, it's 25%. So I'm hopeful that we're going to get a handle on some of this as, as we, you know, people are seemingly taking it a little bit more seriously. Um, there's been some questions about, is the virus airborne? And I, there was a letter by several hundred physicians to the World Health Organization that they need to look at this. And I think it's a reasonable question. Is it classically airborne like measles and things like that? Probably not, but there have definitely been case reports of airborne spread. Now in the hospital, it certainly is, is potentially aerosolized because we do procedures, breathing treatments, intubations, where they cause these particles to get aerosolized. And the idea of an aerosolized particle is one that's sort of floating in the air, not falling directly to the ground. But there were a couple cases in China, one where there was a restaurant and there was, they mapped out the airflow from the air conditioner. And it, it, this person was sort of in one corner of the restaurant and everybody downstream, many of them got infected. So that was an evidence of you know, potential airborne spread. There was another case in China where some Buddhist people had gone to a temple and then they were coming back in a bus and many of them got infected on that bus. And here in Washington state, there's a sort of class, you know, uh, uh, fairly famous study where 52 people in a choir were infected and they were in close proximity singing and we thinking the singing, you know, caused the, airborne, air, the virus to be airborne. At this point, we don't really know. It's certainly possible. Um, and so we just need to be, be careful. And that's why, you know, close proximity, yelling, singing, talking um, are, are dangerous. Um, I'm gonna briefly touch on this Henry Ford uh, hydroxychloroquine study because, you know, the. Trump has been touting that it uh, proves that hydrochloroquine works. You know, I think we've got to be careful. That, that study, if you look at it, it's a little, you know, the, the data is a little wonky. Why is it? Well, you know, we've got a number of randomly controlled trials, which we know are the kind of the, the way you determine whether or not something works or not. We've got five or six now that have shown no benefit from hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, zinc, and things like that. Henry Ford is, is claiming that they did a study and it showed a 50% reduction in mortality. The problem is when you get to the nitty gritty and you look at the study, you know, first of all, it, it was not randomized or doubly blind. So it means that the doctors carefully picked who got what medicine, who got hydroxychloroquine and who didn't. So that, you know, leads to potential bias, even unintentional bias. Um, secondly, the group that actually got hydroxychloroquine was far more likely to have also gotten dexamethasone. And dexamethasone is a, is a steroid that in randomly controlled trials significantly reduces mortality. So you've got people getting hydroxychloroquine and dexamethasone, which we know does reduce mortality, versus people that didn't get either. Um, and a very significant number of people in the hydroxychloroquine group got dexamethasone, I think 58% versus 21% in the non-hydroxychloroquine group. So that could certainly cause bias. The other thing was that they dropped about 10% of the patients, meaning that they just didn't include them. And we don't know which group they were in. And so if you drop 10% of the, the patients and it was 200 plus patients, then you can radically skew the number. So if you just, if you drop 200 people that don't fit your criteria, then all of a sudden you have a 50% mortality reduction. If you included them, it might be no reduction. And so it's really not a very good study. And again, it's observational. It's not randomly controlled. Now, they are doing a randomly controlled trial at Henry Ford, and the results should be available um, towards the end of the summer. So they are looking that, at this in a different way. There are many, many studies out there going on, 1,200 or so, about you know, one in six involve hydroxychloroquine. And so as these randomly controlled actual valid studies come out, we'll be able to say more. But right now, 
the, the majority of the cases that have been shown have been the randomly controlled trials have not shown either benefit to prophylax, meaning giving people that don't have it, hydroxychloroquine to prevent them from getting it, either um, giving it to severely ill patients, clearly shown has not been effective, and giving mildly ill patients has not been shown to be effective to, to prevent them from getting more severe disease. Now, again, more hydroxychloroquine studies are, are coming, um, but there are quite a few out there already, and so far, the, the valid studies, the randomly controlled trials, have been sort of universally shown that it hasn't really helped that much, and that's been you know, kind of the same you know, experience we've had, you know, me personally in the hospital. Um, I know that we haven't had much luck in our hospital using any of those drugs, um, except for steroids, which seem to do help. Um, I'm going to end this here, but we are going to come going to come back tomorrow. We're going to do another one. And tomorrow we're going to talk about opening schools. We've had a conversation about that. I've gotten tons of questions, you know, here in North Carolina, Governor Cooper, I think this week is going to make a decision. Um, we're also going to talk about increased risk of severe COVID disease in young people, especially if they smoke or vape. And I've personally seen a case where I had to intubate a 23 year old who had very severe COVID symptoms and was a heavy vapor. And I really think personally that that's what, why the guy did so badly. Um, we're gonna talk about Richard Bartlett and his, his claim that he's found a silver bullet for, um, for COVID using budesonide. And we'll, t we'll talk about how maybe that's not exactly true. Um, and um, we'll, we'll talk about a few other things tomorrow, but I'm gonna end this today. And cause we've got, like I said, a lot to cover. I'll be back tomorrow. Um, if you're interested in any of the wellness stuff, we just finished a five-part weight loss um, uh, series that's on the YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, there's lots of good information there. And then all of our, obviously, our COVID updates are there as well. If you like it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook. I'll be back with more tomorrow. Everybody stay safe. Wash your hands. Look after yourselves. Look after your families. Look after those around you. And we'll all get through this. I'll talk to you tomorrow.